You didn't talk to him? Uh, did you meet him at least? Or? No. Uh, boy, that's... <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak. I direct international security studies here at the Wilson Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, which is a uh, meeting uh, to mark the publication of the uh, really brilliant new book by Michael Glennon, uh, The Fog of Law, Law, Pragmatism, Security, and International Law. It's just released um, by, published by Wilson, Wilson Center Press and Stanford University Press, and uh, copies are available for purchase outside the door when the, the session ends for those interested. Um, it's a pleasure to met, welcome uh, Mike Glennon back to the Wilson Center. Uh, he's a professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy up at Tufts. Uh, prior to going to teaching, uh, he was legal counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, and then uh, held a number of uh, different teaching positions before uh, uh, taking up his current uh, post at, at Fletcher. Um, he has published uh, widely on constitutional and international um, legal issues, uh, including several books. Um, the one that I'm, that I'm best familiar with was this one on limits of law, prerogatives of power, interventionism after, after Kosovo. Uh, but there are a variety of other um, uh, volumes um, and topics that he's, his, his work has, has, has uh, covered. Um, he's in demand as a <coughs> witness uh, for the um, um, International Court of Justice and numerous congressional committees. Uh, he's published widely as well uh, in opinion pages. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today <coughs> as, uh, to initiate comment, uh, to initiate discussion, uh, Professor Anthony Arend, uh, who's a professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University. <coughs> uh, he's also the director of the Master of Science in Foreign Service at uh, the Walsh School of Foreign Service within GW, uh, excuse me, Georgetown uh, University. Um, he is a co-founder of the Institute for International Law and Politics at Georgetown and uh, served as, as its director. Uh, he teaches in international law and international organization um, and has uh, published uh, uh, widely on those issues as well. So with that, <coughs> um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mike Glennon and uh, uh, we'll hear from Mike then, then Tony and then open it up for, for discussion. So Mike, when, welcome back to the Wilson Center. Thank you. Hi, Michael. <clears throat> Rob, uh, thank you so much for setting this up and hosting it. It's uh, just a tremendous joy to be back here. I, I spent an extremely happy uh, year here in 2001-2002 uh, as a fellow and uh, made close friends and uh, uh, got uh, a, a start on my uh, research for the uh, book that uh, I finally gave the Wilson Center to uh, publish uh, eight years later. I think that uh, my wife tells me figured out to about 67 words a day, but uh, it did uh, ultimately get delivered. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, not only Rob, who was the uh, sponsor of the program that uh, oversaw my presence here, but uh, my friend Joe Brinley, uh, who is really responsible for our being here today, uh, the uh, head of the Wood uh, Wilson Center Press and uh, Millie Kahn, who was the uh, copy editor of the book, uh, working out of Joe's shop. Uh, finally, let me just uh, in advance uh, thank my old friend Tony Arend for uh, being here. Tony is uh, going to give you the commentary on this, as uh, Rob said. Uh, and uh, there, I, I must uh, warn you at the outset, there's a little circularity in this because my book was, my, my two books, this one and the previous one that Rob referred to, was heavily inspired by the writings of Tony Arendt, who, uh, to my mind, is the cat's whiskers on uh, the subject of use of force law and has got it right time after time courageously uh, in analyzing what the law is and without getting distracted into talking about what the law should be. So um, I, uh, I, I want to... Uh, so I was uh, saying to Rob at lunch, uh, respond today to a question that was uh, put to me by my five-year-old son to whom the book is dedicated when I uh, went home and held up a copy right after uh, Joe sent me an advanced copy, Federal Express. I said, uh, 
William, <coughs> I wrote this book. And he looked at me and said, why? <laughs> um, I, uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, give people a sense, uh, scholars and lawyers and practitioners and law students, give people a sense how uh, international law would be thought about through the prism of pragmatism, particularly issues that arise uh, concerning nerve center security matters, war and peace, proliferation, the crime of aggression, uh, and related matters. Pragmatism is probably, I think it's fair to say, America's most important contribution uh, to the world of philosophy. It was conceived by a group of Harvard seniors uh, in the years prior to the Civil War, made famous in the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Metaphysical Club. Uh, John Dewey, William James, Charles Peirce, and perhaps most prominently for legal purposes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who of course went on to become uh, Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, our Supreme Court, and then a long-serving Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who I, I think it's also fair to say had had as much influence on American legal thinking um, as anyone in modern times, maybe anyone in all times, of, with the exception of uh, the great Chief Justice John Marshall. He is the, the seminal figure, the godfather of legal realism that so distinguishes American thinking from European thinking on this score. Um, which is another one of the reasons that I wrote this book in answer to my little boy. Um, it seemed to me throughout the last 10 years that it was increasingly apparent that American international lawyers think very differently about these issues than European lawyers. And it seems to me that um, the answer lies in, in good part in this philosophy of pragmatism that was developed largely as a counterpoint and response to American transcendentalism, American platonic idealism that had its roots with Emerson and Thoreau and the town where I live, Concord, Massachusetts. Um, so these are the two tensions within, within the American legal establishment. And I think that uh, transcendentalism has won out and continues to win out, frankly, in most of the rest of the world, where I, I think that uh, American international lawyers uh, tend to be much more pragmatic. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. And I want to begin by, by relating to you um, a conversation that uh, occurred over lunch last week that I've, I've been trying to, to think of uh, an, an image or of something that will, in, in one crystalline uh, depiction, convey what pragmatism is all about. And it struck me uh, at lunch last week that an exchange that uh, I was privileged to be present uh, for um, does that. The exchange was between uh, my, my colleague at Fletcher, uh, Miguel Bassanez, who was the deputy director of our Institute on Cultural uh, Affairs uh, and former attorney general of Mexico, and uh, Bob Cordy, uh, Justice Robert Cordy, holds uh, actually uh, coincidentally, Holmes's seat on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and uh, is quite a Holmes scholar. Miguel um, related um, this experience. He said he was in Britain a while ago and he visited a newly constructed university campus and he was taken to a tower overlooking uh, most of the <coughs> campus and he looked down um, and saw no sidewalks, no pathways. And he said to his host, um, where are the sidewalks? And 
his host said, well, we haven't built them yet. We're going to see where people walk before we build the sidewalks. Then we'll build the sidewalks. And he, Miguel said the, the light went on in his mind at that point. That is, um, in many ways, a distinguishing characteristic of international lawyers in the United States. They proceed by looking at the evidence before they apply the idea, to which um, Bob responded. I hope I'm not quoting him without um, permission, but he, he said, yes, and th that's what Holmes meant when he said that the life of the law is not logic, it is experience. The life of the law is not logic, it is experience. In the United States, we look not at what logically ought to be done first, but at empirical data on which the logic subsequently is built. That's the sequence. That's the sequence of, of pragmatist thinkers. So let me just uh, go through um, nine characteristics quickly uh, and give you examples of ways in which I think a pragmatist international lawyer um, would think differently about specific problems in international law and relations than a conventional and read slash European uh, international lawyer because it's, it's instructive be, to be more specific first. Um, pragmatists are anti-formalists. Pragmatists are, as I suggested a moment ago, um, believers in uh, and followers of Holmesian legal realism. They are skeptical about the extent to which um, legal categories, abstract categories, produce the results that they are purported to produce. Um, I'm going to give you an example. It's not an international law case, but it's a beautiful example of the, the formalism that I think would be rejected by pragmatists. There was a case decided by the German Constitutional Court four years ago concerning um, the German shoot-down statute. The following 9-11, you recall when the airplane was flying back to try to crash into the White House, the president supposedly gave authorization to the Air Force to shoot it down. And this issue got debated in the German parliament, and the German parliament enacted a statute authorizing the government to shoot down an airplane in those circumstances. The statute was struck down, invalidated by the German constitutional court on the basis of a constitutional provision guaranteeing the right to life and ensuring that human dignity would be maintained. Well, to a pragmatist, um, that's th those, those, those principles are not dispositive. It's the classic case of a principle, as Holmes said, not deciding the case. It's not as though the people who engaged in the plan to shoot down the airplane in the United States were opposed to the right to life. It's not as though they parted company on the issue of human dignity with um, the people who were opposed to that. No, obviously there was something else going on. It wasn't the category of right to life. It wasn't the category, the form of human dignity on which the opinion was based. And pragmatists say, look, let's be upfront. Let's be open. Let's be candid about the grounds on which we are really deciding these cases. Let's not be formalists. Let's be legal realists. Second, um, <clears throat> pragmatism is anti-idealistic. Idealistic, not in the common sense of the term, but in the philosophical sense. It's, it's, it, it, it rejects platonic idealism. It rejects the notion of a brooding omnipresence in the sky, for example, that can be looked to as the ultimate source of 
the evil to be remedied by creating a, quote, crime of aggression. Um, Michael Walzer, in his book on just and unjust wars, says, starting a war is wrong. Well, to a pragmatist, um, it, it's a lot more complicated than simply identifying an overarching universal moral principle and enacting it into, a, into law. To a pragmatist, the first question is an empirical one. What are the conditions on the ground, and do those conditions support putting in place a rule that does what you want it to do? To give you a homely analogy, it's rather like, th to a pragmatist, thinking about what kind of flowers you want to plant outside your house without investigating first how much rain you get, how much sunlight you get, what the soil is like. No, you've got to look first at the conditions in the world to decide, to make a judgment about whether this particular form of cooperation will be effective. You've got to look at things like the extent to which the, there is relative equality among the parties, to the extent to which there are free riders within the system, um, the, most importantly, the extent to which there is a basic consensus on underlying philosophical values, such as when force should be used. And when you find that those conditions are not present, you conclude, even before you put the rule in place, that it's not going to work. It could have been predicted in 1928 on that basis that the Kellogg-Briand Peace Pact was not going to work based upon the background conditions of the sort that I've just referred to. Third, pragmatists are fallibilists rather than, uh, rather than um, foundationalists. Foundationalism is a, a school within philosophy that suggests that um, there are certain fundamental beliefs that um, must not be questioned. To a pragmatist, every proposition is open to scrutiny. Pragmatists recognize that they might be wrong and are, are, are willing, indeed eager, to revisit the premises on which a policy is based. Think in this regard of policies, for example, concerning negotiation with North Korea, negotiation with Iran. Um, Dick Cheney suggested when he was vice president, we don't negotiate with evil, we defeat it. Well, to a pragmatist, that may um, be one strategy as a starting point, but you follow that through, follow through the policy, for example, of isolating Cuba, and as a fallibilist, be willing to admit that you're wrong. And to revisit the policy and to revise it as need be. Uh, fourth, pragmatists are contextualists rather than essentialists. Essentialism um, s suggests that um, y you can you can you can you know s sit down in your leather armchair and close your eyes and ponder a concept like aggression and come to an objective, universally accepted notion of the essence of aggression that everyone everywhere must understand. Well, um, I indeed, um, you see this argument or a, a, a variation of essentialism today in the attacks on the Obama administration for engaging in extrajudicial killings. If you close your eyes and think about extrajudicial killings and recognize that the essence uh, is fundamentally at odds with our constitutional framework, you will see that this policy is unlawful. Well, to a pragmatist, um, it's all in the context. And the truth is that with respect to extrajudicial killings, for example, um, the context is all important. There are at least 15 factors that bear upon the lawfulness of the use of predators in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. 
um, including factors you know relating to the likelihood of killing civilians, proportionality, um, the nationality of the individual, whether other means have been tried, et cetera, et cetera. F Fifteen factorial, I calculate, produces approximately 3.3 trillion permutations. This is the quintessential example of a legal question that is heavily fact-dependent in its answer. And pragmatists suggest that you can't answer a question like this in the abstract without knowing what the facts are. Um, <coughs> pragmatists are behaviorists rather than mentalists, fifth. Um, they, they suspect that emotions rather than reasons um, shape legalist decisions. And as an example of that, I, I refer you to the um, doctrine of pacta sunt servanda in international law, the principle that a treaty must be carried out in good faith in accordance with its terms. This is set out in the Treaty on Treaties of Vienna Convention. It's said to be the glue that holds the system together um, to a traditional mentalist international lawyer, a rule like this is binding because we say it's binding. We made the rule. It's a positivist system. If we say the rule is binding, it's binding. To a pragmatist, there's an infinite regress here because you have to ask on what is that rule based? What, what is the bindingness of the rule that makes all the other rules binding? And it turns out in the punchline of that story about uh, Russell to be turtles all the way down. It's an infinite regress. To a pragmatist, a rule is binding in international law because the incentive structure, the, the structure of incentives and disincentives that has been put in place causes the price of violation to be too high. And it is ultimately complied with by sufficient number of states in a sufficient number of instances to arrive at the judgment that it's legally binding. Pragmatist six are extremely suspicious of um, facile claims of causation. A few years back, the International Court of Justice decided uh, opinion uh, advisory opinion in the nuclear weapons case, the argument was made, well, we haven't had any use of nuclear weapons since 1945. Um, this is evidence that there is a custom from which we can infer that international law prohibits the use of nuclear weapons. Well, why should we assume that the putative rule prohibiting the use of nuclear weapons was the cause of nuclear weapons not being used? Why is the cause not extended deterrence? Why is the cause not the cost of nuclear weapons? Why is the cause not um, that the nuclear states did not wish to get nuked in return? The doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Um, seventh, pragmatists are more inclined to engage in balancing than in, um, in, in finding per se invalidity. John McCain has famously said that one thing, thing worse than war would be uh, uh, an, Iran, an Iran armed with nuclear weapons. One thing worse than war would be an Iran armed with nuclear weapons. There is a per se um, bright line drawn there. And at that point, um, all bets are off and the sky's the limit. Well, no, to a pragmatist, you don't stop balancing at that point. You look at the question of what the costs are and what the benefits are of using preemptive military force against Iran or North Korea. Um, eight, uh, theorization is also something that pragmatists uh, are, are uncomfortable with. 
they're suspicious of grand theories and excessive abstraction. Um, grand theories, grand strategies don't decide concrete cases. Again, as Holmes said, principles don't decide cases. Show me a principle and I'll show you how it stands for exactly the opposite of what you're arguing. Les Gelb in, uh, in his uh, recent book relates an exchange with Cy Vance. He says he was always after Cy Vance to give more policy speeches and finally in, in bugging Vance, uh, Vance turned to him and said, Les, policy is baloney. And I, I think what Vance meant was exactly what I've been describing, that you, 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 there are so many variables, so much context to take into account that you end up in trying to formulate grand strategy and grand policy, except in a very few rare instances, like you know, containment, Dr. X, uh, et, et cetera, the, the, the Kennan Doctrine, you end up just coming up with a bunch of mashed potatoes that no reasonable person can disagree with. And you know, I think she's been a decent enough Secretary of State, but you read Hillary Clinton's um, grand policy addresses at Georgetown, for example, and you know, I, I defy you to find anything that is remotely useful in these addresses. They, it, it's just one banality after the next that no reasonable person can question. Uh, finally, um, consequentialism. This is really the, the touchstone of pragmatism. Pragmatists believe in evaluating an idea, a rule, by measuring its results, not by measuring it against other ideas or other rules. And here I look most uh, prominently at the use of force rules of the United Nations Charter. Um, pragmatists, in order to assess those rules, measure them not against some abstract morality, not against other ideas, but whether they work. And the conclusion is they don't work. Uh, they have been violated so many times by so many states since 1945, between 200 and 680 times in the estimate of the high-level panel appointed by Kofi Annan, between 200 and 680 times that they've become paper rules. And it's, to a pragmatist, um, no longer accurate to say that these rules are binding international law. Let me just conclude by saying, as you have no doubt intuited, um, pragmatism is a way of thinking about thinking. It has no particular political valence. It's not an argument for being a liberal Democrat or a conservative Republican. And indeed, you can find adherence to the philosophy of pragmatism across the boards. Uh, Judge Richard Posner in Chicago, the former head of the Fifth Circuit, is a pragmatist, so is Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> second, you, you will also be correct in noting what I didn't suggest pragmatism does, and that is provide guidance about ultimate ends. Pragmatism does not, in the phrase of Justice Holmes, tell us what we should want to want. It's a frame of mind but it's not an algorithm for telling you what kind of world you should want to live in. It does not eliminate the need for subjective judgment. What it does do is provide a kind of acid bath for ideas. It permits us, we think, to focus on what really matters without being distracted by extraneous things. Deng Xiaoping probably put it best, the ultimate pragmatist in modern China. He said, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, the question is whether it catches mice. To a pragmatist international lawyer, the test of an international rule is whether it works, period. Tony, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm tempted to begin by saying we actually have four cats. And they're all very different colors, but they all seem to be capable of, of catching mice. I want to talk a little bit about the story that Mike hasn't told you.
And I want to begin by this statement to say this is one of the best books written about international law ever. Now, I said that about Mike's last book, and it was true then. It is true now. Now, as you were hearing Mike speak, you might have been saying to yourself, well, yeah, this, this makes perfect sense. Of course, isn't, isn't that how one should operate? Isn't that how international law should be conceived? Shouldn't we think of it as empirical, as based on what was actually happening in the field and not some abstract idea or abstract platonic category? Shouldn't we be thinking about what actually happens in the practice of states and other international actors? Isn't that the way we should conceive of international law? And if you're saying yes, that's, that's excellent. You might even look at the famous Paqueta Bana case and say, well, in the Paqueta Bana case in 1900, Justice Gray laid out the task for international legal scholars. And he said the purpose of international legal scholars is not to provide their speculation as to what the law ought to be, but to provide trustworthy evidence of what the law actually is. Now, that's exactly what Mike said. So everyone's going, well, well, fine. But here's the story that Mike hasn't told, and this is the genius of his book. And that's this. So many international legal scholars, so many conventional international legal scholars, both American and non-American, have forgotten this concept of pragmatism and this idea that the law has to be embedded in empiricism, that the law has to be connected to the concrete case, to the concrete practice in the field. If we go back, well, you could probably go back to Grotius, but we don't need to go back to Grotius. If we went back to 1945 and looked at the academy, the International Legal Scholar Academy, both within the United States and outside, what we would find prevailing were so many international legal scholars who painted a beautiful picture of the international system. With the end of World War II, with the adoption of the United Nations Charter, and I have it here, with the adoption of the United Nations Charter, suddenly the world seemed to be a better, happier place. And the picture of the international landscape that these scholars painted was a beautiful picture, a picture where a whole host of putative norms. Some of them were reflected in treaties. Some of them were in, heaven forbid, non-binding General Assembly resolutions conveyed to us how international law worked. And that wisdom, if you will, that conventional wisdom of these international legal scholars was propagated over the years. So that even today, most of the international legal community disagrees with Mike's approach. Now, this is the other story. As he presented it, it all sounds very reasonable. It all sounds completely appropriate and consistent with our understanding of practice. Yet, it is contrary to this picture that most international legal scholars paint. If you look at Mike's book, and he lays out extremely well in a few minutes here the basic tenets of pragmatism, he reflects on a number of issues relating to security, including questions of self-defense, nuclear proliferation, and the status of the United Nations Charter. I want to harp for a moment on what he mentioned with respect to the Charter Framework for the Use of Force, because here I think the contrast between Mike's approach and that of the majority, and I would say two-thirds, three-quarters of the majority of international legal scholars, that contrast is dramatic. When the United Nations Charter was adopted in 1945, the cornerstone of the Charter was Article 2, Paragraph 4. It said that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. It was a prohibition, a proscription on both the use of force and the threat to use force. Two exceptions were contained in the Charter, force and self-defense, under Article 51, and force authorized by the United Nations Security Council. Noble goals, noble aspiration. Two-thirds, three-quarters of the international legal community would say, well, that's the law. Here it is. It's in the charter. Mike says, and I agree with him 100%, there may be three of us uh, that, that agree with him 100% on this. Mike says, 
It's not the law. It doesn't matter that it's in the United Nations Charter. It doesn't matter that states solemnly reaffirm these provisions year after year. There are, as he noted, between 200 and 600 violations of this norm. States in their practice do not respect Article 2.4. They may give lip service to it, but it's not there in the practice. It's not there in the empirics. And if that's the case, it can't be the law. That's what a pragmatist approach says. It says, eschew these brooding omnipresence in the skies. Eschew the category of the UN Charter and look at what really happens, what really works. That's the law. And that's the genius of Mike's book. He paints a very different picture. If the majority of the International Legal Academy is painting a beautiful Monet, he might be painting an Edvard Munch. It may not be a pretty picture, but it's an honest picture. And Mike ends his book by saying, we understand the dilemma. As legal scholars, we're also citizens. And as citizens, we want the law to be better. But in order for the law to be better, we owe it to our country, to the international community as a whole, to be honest, brutally honest about what the law is. Because if we don't take this pragmatic approach, and if we aren't brutally honest about what the law is, we can never see it for what it is, and we can never make efforts to improve it. And that's the genius of Mike's book. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. Can I um, just open it up with a question? Um, Picking up on this logic train, you know, law is not logic, it's experience. Okay, lots of crimes occur. You could say we have laws in this country governing property rights and things like people steal, do all kinds of things. The missing piece of it is enforcement, okay? If we had a UN charter where there was sort of prescriptions on use of force and these 200 to 600 violations were addressed through some type of enforcement mechanism, how would that affect you know, your analysis from, through, through the prism of, uh, uh, of pragmatism. I mean, take for, in a different realm, the violations of Iran and North Korea, of, of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, kind of what it says about these types of treaty regimes. So where does the enforcement piece come into uh, the issues that you've, you've tackled? It's all important because the question is the level of compliance. That's the reference point. Now, your analogy is one that is the starting point for a lot of people who hear what Tony and I have just said. Well, why is Article 2.4, which Tony described, not the same as the 55 mile an hour speed limit? It's still the law, even though a lot of people ignore it. We all are familiar with statutes within our domestic legal system that are ignored, but they're still the law. The truth is that there is a fundamental difference between our domestic legal system and the international legal system. The international legal system is voluntarist. It is consent-based. States are bound only to those rules to which they consent. That is not true within the domestic legal order. This is a coercion-based system, as are other domestic legal systems. Try telling the policeman who shows up with handcuffs next time you rob a bank, well, I didn't consent to the prohibition against bank robbery. Good luck. No. So the, the difference is, in short, therefore, that states are lawmakers and their actions have a juridical effect within the system. Individuals operating within the domestic legal order are not lawmakers, and their actions do not have juridical effect. The law is changed through the operation of the legislature and the courts. If a larger measure of coercion were injected into the international legal order through enforcement mechanisms of the sort that Rob has hypothesized, different answer. But that's not the world that we live in. 
Let me just, there's one other case that was int very interesting. Um, Libya, in, you know, after the Lockerbie bombing, Pan Am 103, they went to the International Court of Justice and they sort of said these Security Council sanctions against Libya, you know, there's been no judicial finding of our guilt. They're just sort of saying we're guilty. They're putting all these sanctions on us. And they took that to the case. And uh, it really speaks to your issue about voluntarism. I guess the United States and Britain, you know, just sort of rejected International Court of Justice jurisdiction. But just take us through that kind of situation where you have a norm that's being flouted and then the Security Council kind of weighs in and says we're going to impose a penalty. It's, it's the issue. Iran, when uh, Ahmadinejad was at the Security, at the General Assembly, just said these, all these sanctions are illegal, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, Tony, maybe you'd like to comment on what I just said and respond to that question, or I'll be glad to do it. Well, and what, and what you just said, I would agree with Mike. Something that we oftentimes forget about, this is to your first question, Rob, is that states constitute the law so that they both constitute it and it's addressed towards them, and that's why there's a very different uh, dynamic taking place. Now, if you want to take on that, I'll respond to it after you can well, want. Well, I think it's a classic example of a situation in which, in principle, the, the uh, standard of voluntarism is all controlling. What the court acknowledged in that case is that there is no requirement in international law to extradite an individual from your state to another state. Um, it is a voluntarist system. You, you are not bound by an extradition requirement unless you consent to it. There is no requirement, mm -hmm. no overarching requirement within the international legal system that compels extradition. Extradition treaties are entered into for a reason, mm -hmm. so as to um, make clear that a state has accepted a requirement with respect to a second state to engage in extradition. The Libya case was, without getting into the details, uh, um, a case that fudged the question of whether the Security Council had authority to uh, do what Libya objected to, um, but it's not directly pertinent to what we've been talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Greg. If, if you, there's a microphone, and just identify yourself and thank Greg. Greg Tillman, Arms Control Association. I have a question about one's general orientation as a pragmatist to the idea of, of violating the letter of a treaty, uh, but not the spirit of the treaty. And the classic example in my mind is, is the Soviet construction of a large phased array radar uh, in, in Siberia, which uh, clearly was not in the location permitted by the treaty. But we know now historically that the Soviets did not intend to use it against the purposes of the treaty. It was not a, uh, a battle management radar. It was a, a, a ballistic missile early warning radar. They built it there because for them the uh, the requirement that it be uh, at the perimeter oriented outward, it was at the perimeter of the permafrost region and everywhere beyond that would be much more expensive to build. Uh, so this is a case where the U.S. lobbied very hard for six years, ultimately prevailed. Uh, the Soviets had to back down, uh, deconstruct the whole radar, very expensive. So I'm kind of left with the idea, was, is that a classic case of a non-pragmatic uh, uh, interpretation of, of treaty law? I'm not sure that uh, pragmatists and non-pragmatists would come to a different conclusion on that issue. The issue was analyzed in terms of Article 60 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which was taken to state customary international law, even though the United States is not a party to it. Article 60 uh, says, in effect, that when a state engages in a material breach of a treaty, as we alleged that the Soviets did in building the radar at Krasnyarsk, um, the aggrieved state has the option of either denouncing the treaty or um, engaging in what would be a violation in whole or in part or suspending the operation of the treaty for a given period of time. And it was that um, sort of Damocles that hung over the Soviet Union as a consequence of American objections to Krasnyarsk. But 
I, I don't see that as an example of a pragmatist versus non-pragmatist um, um, uh, 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 course of action. To Tony, am I missing something? I mean, I don't think so either. I mean, I think both sort of the conventional approach to treaty interpretation as well as more pragmatic approach to treaty interpretation would try to determine what the interests of the parties were when the treaty was concluded. And ideally, what you would then want to do is find out exactly why they are doing it, what, why this is taking place, and then see if it's violating the, the essence of what the treaty is about. So, I mean, I think to some degree, both schools would look at the spirit of the treaty. I think that's, that wouldn't necessarily be informed by one school or the other, would be my sense. Ed. Ed is a former legal advisor to the State Department, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you may have been at the State Department at the time this issue arose. Uh, you're talking about the Lockerbie? At the well, we're talking about Krasnoyarsk. It's on. I honestly don't remember the, the Krasnoyarsk issue. It, um, that was, I guess, the actor guys did that. But um, <clears throat> just on the Lockerbie, just to make a comment, that yeah. um, one of the things I, I, I did was nervous about and did not have any talking points on was what if we'd lost that case mm. at the ICJ, mm. what would we have done? Mm. Mm. Um, as it turned out, we won. So it was sort of, I think, the classic example of one uses international law when it uh, suits could, could you just clarify, was that case about the legality of imposition of, 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 of sanctions or on the narrow issue of turning the suspect over to no, a it was, um, <coughs> No, it was, um, well, um, one of our demands was that they um, turn over the suspects. But it, um, the basic issue was whether or not what we had engaged in was, an illegal, was a violation of 2-4 because we had threatened to use force uh, in response to, to their actions. But, um, mm -hmm. but um, <coughs> um, actually, I have, I have two questions. I'll, I'll just ask one so I don't uh, I know. If you have time, I'll, I'll do the second one. But just to make sure, I, I, I think I... I mean, I, I think you you throw a lot of, um, of uh, fuel on this particular fire here, but at time, uh, but on your basically a pragmatist, um, and this is sort of following up on your sort of point five, I think, um, um, must take the position that there is no such thing as customary international law, given that one of the two elements of customary international law is opinio juris, um, and you, I think you're basically saying that, and and, and quite frankly, I have a terribly hard time finding in what's uh, quoted as customary international law, the opinio juris, uh, because I think people, I think states comply with, uh, do these patterns because it suits their interests. And it's done for convenience and the price is too high not to and so forth, but it's not because, ah, that is the law and therefore I must do it. Well, it, it asks a question that we could have an entire seminar meeting on, and uh, our, our students at Fletcher puzzle over this issue. Um, let me just give you a little background um, before answering the question. The, the, the black letter law, quote unquote, um, is as follows. In order to um, find the existence of a customary norm, you have to have three things. One, a practice that is generally engaged in by states. It need not be unanimous, but it has to be general and fairly uniform. Second, the belief, the subjective element, the, 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 the intention to do that because it is a juridical obligation, because it is legally required, and third, a causal relationship between the two from the North Sea's Continental Shelf's case. The court said um, some patterns of practice arise out of comity mm -hmm. or convenience or mere courtesy, and we need to separate those from patterns of practice that are adhered to because states believe that those actions are legally required. There has to be a causal relationship. And in that case, Judge Locks said exactly what Ed has just been hinting at. That causal nexus requirement places the bar so high that we're never going to be able to establish 
the existence of a customary norm because states, Locks said, act for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. And in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion that I described a while ago, you have a perfect example of that. What, is there a, a single reason that nuclear weapons have not been used since World War II? Answer, no. It's very hard applying that high standard to find the existence of customary international law. The essay question, my last international law class is agree or disagree, there's no such thing as customary international law. It's a question on which reasonable people can, can and do differ. Um, m my own view is there's a tremendous overlap, and I'd be very interested in hear, hearing Tony's yes, answer yes. to this. There's a tremendous overlap between the analysis of customary international law and another source of law, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. And the, the two are, are very difficult to, to disentangle. As an example of an instance in which this second source may be relevant, think about assassination. I think that the effort to assassinate Fidel Castro during the Kennedy administration violated international law, as the Church Committee concluded. I don't think it's permissible under international law for one state to engage in an effort to assassinate the leadership of another state, at least in times of peace when those in individuals are not in the military chain of command, as was true of Castro in the 60s. Um, is that because there's a customary norm um, is it because it, it flows from, as, as a kind of corollary, from the United Nations Charter's prohibition against the use of force, as some people suggest? I don't think it's the latter, because that was assassination, political assassination, I think, was, uh, and I, I know, uh, regarded as unlawful long before uh, the interstate use of force, war, was banned in 1945 or 1928. Mm -hmm. Go back into the 1900s, it was clearly believed at the time that you can't assassinate the leaders of another state. Why? I think that it was a general principle of law accepted by civilized nations, and it just really is uh, almost a... a it, it goes to the core of what we mean by sovereignty. It's hard to imagine um, states as sovereign entities if one state can engage in this kind of uh, police activity or enforcement jurisdiction, to put it euphemistically, <laughs> within the territory of another state. So um, I... I the question that Ed raises is an extremely difficult one, but I don't think that even during the, the last administration, I don't think that um, in, in private councils in the Pentagon, the top lawyers in the Bush administration would have said that there's no such thing as customary international law. I think we consistently and correctly took the position that the use of biological weapons against a civilian population is a violation of probably um, a general principle accepted by civilized nations, but perhaps customary international law. It's a hard question. Tony, what do you think? Yeah, I'm a big believer in customary international law, and I actually think customary international law really forms the web of the entire international legal framework. Uh, when we start, we could talk about all kinds of principles of jurisdiction. We could talk about all sorts of things that, that are international law because they were created through custom. So I, I, I tend to think it gets neglected, and actually the irony is it's some of the conventional international legal scholars, a lot of the European scholars who kind of downplay customary international law and focus on treaties to a, a very textualist, legalist approach. 
I do think Mike is absolutely correct, though, when you look at, say, the North Sea Continental Shelf case, to say that there has to be a causal link is not correct. I think for a rule of customary law to exist, you need a practice and you need a, a belief that the practice is international law, which doesn't say anything about why you're actually complying with it. We could, I, I, can, I don't want to get into the confusion with what Rob was saying before about a 55 mile an hour speed limit, but I could, I could say that we would all agree that a 55 mile an hour speed limit was the law. That has nothing to do with why we may or may not choose to go at that level. And if I look at something like, say, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, uh, when it is defining customary international law, it says international custom as evidence of a general practice accepted as law, meaning you acknowledge that as law. It doesn't say anything about why you may or may not follow it. There's no causal link required. I see this as a differentiation among different types of rules or different types of norms that exist in the international system. There are all kinds of rules, rules of the game, rules of etiquette, that we may habitually comply with, but nobody regards them as law. Something that is regarded as law has a distinctive character. We think of it differently. Uh, example I use in class. All of us are sitting around this table. Why? Well, it's kind of a rule of the game. It's, it's what you do when you're in the boardroom at the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is sort of what, what you do. Uh, but nobody would regard it as legally required if, if Ed were to stand up and, you know, turn around, no one would say, you know, let's bring in the D.C. police and, and arrest him because it's thought of as a different kind of rule. That, in my view, is the distinguishing characteristic of customary international law. It's reflected in practice, and that kind of rule is believed to be the law. It is regarded as law that has nothing to do with the reason why states comply. Dominic, D.C. Bar. I have a question, please, about the religion of human rights and how a pragmatist approaches this subject or makes an exception for it. And if you would address specifically the torture convention and Abu Ghraib. Um, Donald Rumsfeld offered to resign as soon as he became aware of the Abu Ghraib scandal, and maybe that would have been a good thing for international human rights. You know, I, I see Steve Lagerfeld over there, and your you're raising the issue of torture reminds me of one of the, maybe the first piece that I wrote for the Wilson Quarterly was on this issue. It wasn't exactly on, um, on the international law question, but since you, you put the issue on the table, I'll, 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 I'll rephrase your question to make it harder uh, and, and, and hypothesize um, the um, ticking time bomb hypothetical in which, uh, as we all know, this has been discussed so much, the article was about that, uh, ticking time bomb hypothetical, which is put to uh, Justice Black by one of his clerks. Uh, Clerk asked, uh, so, Mr. Uh, textualist, you, you claim to apply the Constitution literally. Uh, there's a prohibition against uh, cruel and unusual punishment, prohibition against deprivation of due process um, in circumstances of the sort that we're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you, you are the, the ultimate um, anti-balancer. You believe in applying rules of per se invalidity. How should we proceed in the face of knowledge that um, a terrorist who has been captured knows where a ticking time bomb is that's going to go off in New York City and kill 13 million people in two hours. Should we torture him? His clerk asked Black. And Black's answer, the clerk reported, was, of course, but we could never say that. <laughs> <laughs>
What Black, I think, wisely was suggesting is that there is a slippery slope, and you cannot make exceptions in a prohibition against torture. You can't do what Alan Dershowitz torture court. wants, to have a torture court issue warrants for the police to engage in torture in circumstances such as this. To regulate is to legitimate, and the practice is so horrific that no civilized state can formally recognize its acceptability without turning its back upon history. Of course, but we should never say that. We could never say that. Of course means yes, in sub silentio, without having the law legitimate it, we need to recognize that uh, on a utilitarian basis, probably, although Black didn't apparently say this, um, having to choose between one life and 13 million lives is a choice that for reasonable people, um, it, it, a choice that for reasonable people it's not hard to make. So um, how does a pragmatist come down? I, I, I find great wisdom in, in Hugo Black's answer, although I'm much more of a balancer than I think Black was. And um, I, I believe that it is, it is unfortunate for the United States to have contemplated formal exceptions to the prohibition against torture. Uh, I'm not sufficiently familiar, I, I must confess, with the instances in which individuals have been tortured uh, or the, the circumstances uh, that that were used to justify that, but um, I would not draw a, a bright line against it, a, 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 a bright line around it um, in practice, although I would in the law, I, I would have an absolute unqualified prohibition in domestic as well as international laws as the torture convention does. Tony, you want to comment? Well, I would agree with what Mike just said. The one thing that, that I've oftentimes thought about, uh, aside from the fact that I'm not sure torture ever really works, I'm not sure it ever produces the answer that you want to get. It sometimes produces the answer you want to hear, but it may not give you the truth. And I think a major concern about ever trying to condone torture is that you imply that it may be legitimate and you encourage its use. And I think that's absolutely a very bad place to go, especially from a legal perspective. Okay, that, that having been said, if you're in the situation where I say, Mike, I have 100% certainty that Rob has planted a bomb, and I know that if you torture him in this way, you will get the bomb. Legally, you can't condone it. I agree. Whether in practice Mike does it, I think many people would say yes. Now, here's what I would add in those circumstances. I think if a decision maker, be it the president or be it someone in the field that is making a decision to violate the law, that they understand that they're making a decision to violate the law and that they willingly understand that they are subjecting themselves to criminal and civil liability. In other words, if, if you're in that situation and you say, well, gee, it's one person versus 13 million people, I'm going to do this one person in, you understand the choice you're making and you subject yourself to civil and criminal liability rather than trying to get some kind of dispensation or excuse. So in other words, if you're making a hard choice, you really are making a hard choice. You know, I, Tony uh, reminds me, there is uh, one uh, thing I would add to the answer that I gave, and this is developed in Ben Wittes' uh, excellent book on this issue, uh, in which he suggests uh, and, and argues in favor of requiring the president to take personal responsibility mm -hmm. for an act of torture and pardoning the individuals who engage in the law of violation. And uh, Ben says if the president is not willing to do that, the case for tor torture is not strong enough. Mm. So uh, 
you know, no plausible deniability, make the president, put the president in a position where he's personally got to authorize it. And then when inevitably the poor gumshoes who engage in the actual act are sued, brought before the court, indicted, make the president stand up and uh, give them impunity. But I, I, I want to suggest, coming back to uh, the, the initial question, it is, uh, as your question suggests, a classic example of something that distinguishes pragmatists from idealist because the idealist starts out with the view that there is a kind of natural law proscription against torture. There's a human right against torture that flows from uh, brooding omnipresence in the sky, um, you know, pure reason, right reason, um, theistic premises, whatever. And a pragmatist engages in the kind of consequentialist balancing that Tony and I just had. I, after 9-11, I was at a a meeting that dealt with the intersection of law and security, and the topic was uh, nuclear terrorism. And uh, they went around the room and asked people, "What would what would you do if a nuclear weapon went off in an American city?" And uh, uh, my favorite response was from one of the, the participants who said, "We'd have to take a hard look at the NPT." <laughs> and um, I so, was at that meeting. <laughs> so uh, we're going to leave it there. There's time for. Uh, uh, individuals to purchase books and to uh, uh, have them uh, uh, signed by the author, uh, to visit with the author. This has been, uh, the book is The Fog of Lords. It's a real, you know, uh, I'm not, I can't say with the kind of authoritative uh, standing that the Tony has in terms of its contribution to the, to the international law, but it is a, just a, a, a superb book. Um, uh, this is the type of book uh, one would like to think the Wilson Center was invented to, to support, created to support. So we're very grateful to Mike Glennon for coming down uh, to uh, uh, present on, on the topic, for Tony from coming across town to, uh, to comment on it, for all of you to be with us today. We're going to leave it there. You can take up your questions with, with uh, uh, Mike uh, after the conclusion of, of the program. So books are for sale there. Please join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Go ahead. Mike? Great job. Go, go ahead and ask him. Yeah. My pleasure. Well, my pleasure. The nice thing about it is even if somebody were to read it and disagree, it's going to make them think. So even if somebody, even if Anne Marie Slaughter were to, I wonder if she will, will read this. I, th I think the problem with yours, you know, where you get on the torture question, is that you lose the rule of law.